Hello. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm Matt. Uh, I am unashamedly a geek, uh, as are, I think, just about everyone here. Um, I have many levels of geekiness. Uh, I've always liked model railways. At the moment, I do a lot around observability and monitoring and things like that, so drawing pretty pictures and interacting with APIs and pulling all the data off. And this project goes back a good few years. It moved. Excellent. That means it's working. Um, keep an eye on the train, by the way. It will move back and forth, hopefully, if everything's working throughout the presentation. If it starts to look like it's going to fall off either end of the track, please shout. Because <laughs> the one thing I haven't put on here yet... is a buffer stop. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, um, I've been mucking around with model railways for years, and about nine or ten years ago, Network Rail open sourced a load of their data, and I built a website for train spotters. And the idea was that on your, tra on your phone, you could look up what your nearest train stations were, it would tell you how many services were going through them during a certain time of the day. You could then go off and you could collect the locomotive numbers or the wagon numbers or whatever it was you were interested in. And I called it lunchtime trains. And I didn't think anyone was using it. So I went to shut it down and loads of people went, whoa, no, don't do that. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't afford to keep it going. So in the back of my head, I've always had a dream. And the dream is this, okay? A completely autonomous model railway using these network rail feeds to move trains around the network in real time. Okay. Stations are big. My house is not. <laughs> Therefore, we have a small test track. There's actually an even smaller test track that's in Engage, which is behind it. Um, but a lot of my stuff's in storage at the moment for reasons I won't bore you with, and therefore I couldn't actually find my Engage locomotive to demonstrate that side of it. Hmm. So, what do we need in order to get the stuff from network rail controlling the train? Like you have already seen, and I'm really glad that worked at the beginning because I'm not convinced it's going to work again looking at it. First of all, we need the data feeds. Then we need something that will convert that into something useful. Then we need some kind of command and control software. Then we need a hardware interface to take the stuff from the command and control software and send it to the track. And then finally, we need the, the track itself. So in my particular setup, I'm using network rail for the data feeds. The data converter is some custom code I've written that is available on um, GitHub, and I'll be sharing the link at the end of that if anyone's interested in that. The command and control software is something called JMRI. Um, it's American, so it's the Java Model Rail Road interface instead of the Model Railway interface. Um, and then finally, we've got a hardware interface from an organization called Merg. I should have said this, asked this at the beginning, but how many people in here are interested in the model railway side of this? Quick show of hands. Okay, that's a significant proportion. How many of you are interested in the network rail side of things? Okay, there's definitely an overlap in that group. <laughs> but to prove the point, how many of you are interested in both? Yeah, that's like half the room. Awesome. Um, I, knew that, I knew this was the place, if I was going to give this talk anywhere, I knew that this was the place to do it. Um, how many of you know Merg, the Model Electronics Railway Group? One, two, three, four, okay. So maybe five or six of you. Um, for those of you that don't, Merg is a community that is global. I believe it started here in the UK. I've not been a member for very, for very long. Um, but they do all kinds of kits that you buy as PCBs and components. Most of them are through hole, but we are seeing some SMD stuff creeping in now, which is a shame for me, because I can't stand doing SMD soldering, and I missed the workshop on that one. Um, but they do kits that will do pretty much anything from driving the locomotives like we've got here, to controlling servos and solenoids for point motors and everything like that. And you can do, if you couple it with JMRI, you can do a computer-controlled model railway 
with an app called Engine Driver, so you can drive the trains from your... Behave. <laughs> the one signal I have got is that because this has got lights on it, the red lights are now this end, so I know it's going to move that way next. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Merg, you can do a computer-controlled layout for about 75 quid for all the electronics and stuff. It costs £16 a year to be a member, and as part of that you get access to the forum, and the forum is full of people who know far more about electronics, never mind trains, than I dare say I ever will. And they are incredibly helpful as well. So we've got Merg that's doing the circuit boards that are underneath this, and I'll be stood out there somewhere after the talk if people want to come and see the circuit boards properly. I've got some photos of a couple of them later on in the talk. Um, but Merg are a really cheap way of getting computer control. As an example, if you wanted to go out and buy a commercial offering such as the ECOS system or even the Hornby um, e-Link or whatever it's called, you're probably talking a start of about 250 quid. Um, I think the ECOS platform starts at about 500 quid. So Merg is a really cost-effective way of doing this, and you get to solder loads of stuff together at the same time. And then finally, there's the model railway. Someone did ask for the geek specs. Given how many of you put your hands up and said, yes, model railways, uh, the locomotive is a Backman Class 66. Um, it's got a lock sound ESU sound decoder in it, which is what's generating the sounds that we can't actually hear yet. Um, again, I'll play with that at the end if I've got time. Um, and the track is Pico code 75. Okay, so network rail data feeds. Um, this site, I'm used to having the screen behind me, it's weird seeing it down there. Um, the site, the wiki.openraildata.com is probably the best place to go to get started. There's loads of examples on there and it gives you all the information about all of the data because, as it says at the bottom, data comes in multiple formats and not all formats contain all of the data. There's one particular data set where if you download the JSON version of that data set, it's missing three fields that are in the tab delineated version of the data set. But it's the same data set. That took me about three and a half hours to debug. Because uh, <laughs> it was data I wanted to look at. It, they've got static data sets that, have thing, that are updated once every six months or so that have got things like every single possible stopping or passing point on the entire rail network, and that includes London Overground and things like that. So all of the signals, all of the level crossings, all the signal boxes where they still exist, the junctions, the points, the stations, the platforms, the through lines, the up, all of it. And it will tell you whether a line is an upline or a downline, or whether it's supposed to be that, depending on the running order. Phenomenal amount of information. I'm getting jittery now about that. Um, and so, and then they've got other dynamic sets of data. So on a Monday, you can download a file that will give you a list of every single service that is meant to run, passenger and freight, for the, f uh, for the coming seven days. And then every morning, you download a much smaller file that gives you an update on what's changed on that. And then what they give you, and it's what I'm using for this demonstration, is they give you a fire hose of data. And that comes in over a protocol called Stomp, which I'll talk about in a moment. And in that fire hose, it's a JSON blob. I'm assuming everyone knows what I mean when I say JSON. Um, yeah, cool, great, lots of people nodding. If you don't, it's a really nice way of structuring data in a way that's almost human readable, but is a lot more machine readable than XML. Um, and so you get this blob of this JSON, and you get one of those through about every 30 seconds or so. And it can contain anywhere up to 6,000 data points. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you can contain any, anywhere up to 6,000 data points every 30 seconds. And it is every single movement that has happened on the network for every single service, freight or passenger, since it last sent a message. 
that's quite a lot of data to be decoding. So I'm deliberately looking for key things as I, as I run through it. And again, I'll come on to that in a moment. So Stomp then. Um, it's a bit of a weird one. It's a, messaging, it's a message queue protocol that's been around for decades. Um, it's not a particularly nice format to deal with. I would far rather be dealing with what most things at EMF camp seem to run on and just about everything else I've used recently does as well, which is MQTT. I assume people are familiar with MQTT. Yeah, cool. Um, so preferred way of doing this stuff, take a JSON blob, dump it onto MQTT, pick up the JSON at the other end, absolutely awesome. Don't have to worry about any delineations or anything like that. Um, Stomp is almost a, a I have to get this right. It's not quite a, its own binary blob, but it's certainly a sort of a packed message format. So find someone else that's written a library to deal with that for you. That's what I do. Um, and don't worry about the format. But what we effectively do is we connect to the server. We set up a callback function. And um, the, the, the callback function gets triggered um, whenever we get a message come in. Um, and you, know, you can see it on the screen here. So my listener is a generic callback thing. Um, we've got the connection details in there. Um, we're connecting to data feeds. And every time a message comes in, we're going to look through it. And we're going to say, OK, if in the body of the message, we've got a field that's called lock stanox. Stanox is one of the multitude of descriptor types you can get for a particular location on the railway. You have tip locks, stanox. I can't remember what the other ones are. Um, so every lo the vast majority of locations actually have three different references. And when you get onto platforms in specific stations, you've actually got references for both the station and the platform. And it all turns up either in JSON or tab delineated text. It's horrible. But it works. Um, so what we're saying here is if the location Stanox matches 77301, which happens to be Cardiff Central Station, all lines, um, then print a message saying this particular service has just arrived at Cardiff Central on platform, whatever. And in that JSON blob that comes through, and this is coming through on the fire hose, by the way, this is this fire hose message that I was talking about, um, in there, for each service, you get this little block. And it's got all the information that I need in order to print this message out. So we're connecting to Stomp. We're pulling the messages through. Uh, now we need to pass it to something else. So we're going to pass it to JMRI. Um, and as I say, that is the brains of the operation. Should have kept this closer. Hang on. That's better. Um, OK, so JMRI. It's Java-based. It works. It's been around for a long time, actually. It's been, it's been around for a good 10, 12 years, I think, maybe longer than that. Um, the nice thing about it being Java-based, um, and I am incredibly prejudiced against Java because of my day job, um, but the nice thing about it being Java-based is that it will run on Windows, it will run on Mac, and it will run on Linux. So my laptop's running Ubuntu, um, and it runs really nicely on there. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi as well. So if you want to make a Raspberry Pi the brain of your railway, um, then that's great. If, like me, you're having trouble sourcing Raspberry Pis at the moment, and I think that's probably everyone, um, I've actually found out that the old Dell Ys thin client terminals come with really good um, resources in them, and you can pick them up for about 20 quid on eBay. Uh, for 4 gig of RAM and about 32 gig of flash um, with a, a dual core processor in there and a nice graphics card. So I'm starting to move towards using those as well. Um, they do 8 gig versions and 16 gig versions of the RAM and those as well. Um, it's got multiple applications on what you want, it, what, on, what you want JMRI to do. This can get quite confusing because you have to launch them individually. So Panel Pro is what I'm running at the moment in the background here to do the actual control of the railway. And you can map out your railway in that, and you can put in all your points. And when you click on the point, it moves it on the layout and all of that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to work with the decoder that's inside the locomotive, you close down Panel Pro, and you open up Decoder Pro, and you then use that. And there's a couple of other ones in there as well. So that side of it can get a little bit complicated, but usually I just open up Panel Pro because the decoder works, so I don't need to worry about that. It uses Jython. Um, I'm a Python developer. Anyone here heard of Jython before? 
Yeah, okay, I thought it would probably be a low number. Um, Jython allows you to run Python inside a Java environment. Okay, this is cool. Jython's really old. Um, Jython is so old that actually it doesn't support Python 3. Um, when did Python 2 go end of life? Was it 2000 and... Was it last year when end, completely end of life, but it was unmaintained for a good five or six years, security updates only, isn't it, and things like that. Um, it doesn't look like they're going to do a version of Jython that runs Python 3. So this causes me a problem. However, JMRI supports MQTT, but that requires even more stuff to be set up because now you need to add an MQTT server into it and actually it only supports MQTT for controlling signals and um, points and a few other things, but it doesn't allow you to use MQTT to control uh, trains and move them around. It's got a TCP-based API called Y Throttle or We Throttle for control via mobile devices and this is the engine driver app I mentioned earlier on. However, the API for that is unique, and we'll have a look at that now. That is what a message to the way you throttle API looks like. So it uses these brackets to differentiate between the locomotives that are stored in the system, and then it uses those ones to show the values for the settings. The settings are always in the same order, but never key value pairs. And then that's your delimiter between commands. So it's not comma separated, it's not tab separated or semicolon, it's bracket, semicolon, bracket separated. So it's an interesting little thing to work with, work with. Oh yeah, and it sends data back to you, terminated by new lines, but it will send you multiple new lines, but it won't tell you which of those new lines is the final new line it's gonna send you. So yeah. So here's an example. This is how we set a function. So we have a throttle, throttle zero. We're sending an action. We're making sure we're using DCC short mode for those of you that don't know, and I didn't until I started doing all of this stuff. DCC for controlling, which is digital control for model railways as opposed to just varying the, uh, the voltage that runs through the track. Uh, it has two modes. It has short mode, which is zero to nine, and it has long mode, which is zero to 999. So depending on how many locomotives you've got on your layout, depends on whether you want to use short mode or long mode. We're using short mode. Channel three, that's what the decoder is set to. In fact, if you buy a new train that's got a DCC chip on it, it will be channel three. So if you already have multiple locomotives and you put them all on the network at the same time and you hit go, they all move. <laughs> and because they're not set to the same speed levels, they all move at different speeds. So the first thing you do when you get a new locomotive is you put it onto the track and you change what the ID is on the chip so that they don't start crashing into each other. If you're really lucky, they will all at least move in the same direction. Sometimes they don't. Um, we've then got that weird delimiter thing in the middle that says, okay, we know what we're talking to now. Let's work out what the command is. And so we're setting a function then we're saying whether we're gonna turn that function on or off, and then we send it anywhere from 00, zero to 99 as the function. Now, I've picked 10 arbitrarily here, okay? Um, one tends to be the lights on and, zero tends to be the lights on and off, and then everything after that is sound or internal lights or, or whatever it is, right? So how do we move a locomotive? If that's setting the functions on and off, how do we move a locomotive? Well, we send it another command, and that looks like this. So you can see we're sending the action. We're using the same throttle. We're saying, yeah, we're still on channel three in short mode. We're, sending, we're setting the speed, which is V. I'm guessing that stands for velocity. I don't know. It doesn't actually say in the documentation. And then we're giving it a value of the speed between zero and 126. So, I'm either overrunning by 26% when I'm up to maximum, or I'm missing two bytes somewhere, and I haven't worked out which it is. But, so that's the control. And then if we want to change direction, then we send it this. So R is the direction, and zero is reverse, and one is forward. 
So even that's not particularly intuitive because to my mind, R would be reverse. So you'd set R to one if you wanted it to go backwards and R to zero if you wanted it to go forwards. But I didn't write this and I don't have the knowledge to write something like this. So therefore, I'm working with what I've got. So I decided to make it a bit easier for myself and I wrote myself a Python library. And this makes things a lot easier. This is the code that's on GitHub, by the way, and it's under this model railways as code thing, which I've started as a thing. I would love that to be just a dumping bucket for people's experiments on how to generate model railways and automate them and all of that kind of thing. So if anyone's got any projects, ping me a message, more than happy to look at including it. Um, as you can see here, we register the loco, we control the functions, we change the direction, we set the speed. So if I was to run this, I won't because that's running at the moment, but if I was to run this, it would create the new locomotive on channel one. It would set the lights off on this one. So locomotive one, function one, value, uh, whether it's on or off. Uh, it would change the direction and we're setting it to one. So it's running in reverse now. Uh, we set the speed to 10, we sleep for five seconds, we set the speed to zero, and then we disconnect from the server. Okay. So that all of a sudden, I don't need to remember all of those delineated commands and all the rest of it. So, 23 minutes in, I'm gonna rocket through this next bit, but like I say, I'll be outside if anyone has any questions. These are what the circuit boards look like from Merg. Um, this is one of their um, servo controllers. Uh, so you have a little nine gram servo underneath your, um, your train track and when you send it the right signal, it moves the arm, the arm moves the points to either open or close them so that the train ends up going in the right direction. Um, I've gone through most of this. Um, oh, I've said on here, block, control, oh, block detection, that was the bit I was missing. Um, block detection, for those of you who don't know it, the network is divided, the national rail network is divided into loads of blocks uh, and Trains enter the blocks and then they leave the blocks and all of that is monitored because that's how you know how close the trains are together. That's very simplistic. I know we have some signaling engineers in here. Um, yeah, hi at the back there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, forgive me if that's a little bit too simplistic, but that's effectively what we're doing. You can do exactly the same thing on your model railway. And it basically means that you can then start doing automated signaling. So you can say, you know, there's five trains on the layout. I've got 18 different blocks. If there's a train in block A, then there can't be a train in block B. It has to be in block C before the train in block A can be released into block B kind of thing, all of that kind of stuff. JMRI actually allows you to script all of that and we'll deal with all of it as well. So you can get some really awesome prototypical running on it. Um, as I say, cheap to join, kits aren't expensive, you get full computer control of your layout. So if we put all of this together, he says, rapidly trying to come to the end of his waffling. Um, this is what the new function call looks like, okay? So this is using my function. Uh, this is using my library that I've written. So when the message comes in, it gets sent to this on message event, and we, there's the code from before. You know, if the Stanox is this, Cardiff Central, then if it's passed through, just print pass through to the screen, don't do anything. Okay, because I'm only actually interested in stuff that goes back and forwards. If it's coming in, then move the train like that. That was perfect timing. This is live, by the way. This is, every time this moves, that means something has gone through Cardiff Station, has pulled in at a platform, or has pulled away from a platform at Cardiff, okay? So this is, this is real time. Um, and then once you've done that, because it's only short, Set of, um, section of track, change direction, so that the next time a train comes in, you move the other way. Now, if you were running this on a much larger scale, you can actually allocate this to platforms. So you can say, you know, when a train leaves platform six at Cardiff, move the train that's in platform six on my layout out of platform six and off onto the network, onto the model railway network, all right? Um, I have actually slightly modified this, and that's why the microphone's there, for those of you who are wondering. In theory, at least, if a train goes steaming through Cardiff, and there aren't many that do, but if a train goes steaming through Cardiff, the horn should sound on that locomotive using one of the function calls, okay? Um, but that's, I haven't checked the timetable. This is what that script actually outputs. And you can see where we're calling the functions. 
and you can see you know, service blah has just arrived at Cardiff Central on platform zero or on platform six. These are screenshots from the other day when I was putting this together. Um, but, you know, so on my screen I get a readout of, of what's happening. So that's the system. What's next? Um, I want to build a proper layout rather than this. Um, that means finding a suitable location. Um, the St. Ives branch line is probably going to be my first target. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, how many of you know the St. Ives branch line? Okay, a handful of you, cool. Okay, so first of all, it is absolutely beautiful. It is a stunning bit of scenery running from Carbis Bay, and in fact, before that, Leyland, all the way along the Cornish coast into St. Ives. Uh, and if you're really lucky, you can look out the window and you can actually see the seals sunbathing on the rocks and stuff like that at the right time of year as you're traveling down that, time, that thing. Perhaps more importantly than that, it's a single line track. That makes it a lot less complicated. Because trains either run to St. Ives or from St. Ives, but never at the same time. It's also quite quiet, so I don't need to worry about having to deal with 400 trains an hour or whatever it is that might go through somewhere like Reading or Clapham Junction or somewhere like that. Um, so it's quite a nice, small, compact line that I can use to expand on this and actually get it to the point of, okay, that train should actually be at that signal. Have I got the speed settings right on my code so that the train on the layout is doing the same scale speed as the train that's on the national network? Um, obviously, you need to work out the tip lock, the stanox, and all the rest of it for, uh, for each section of the code for that and then write the code based on Wii Throttle to talk to JMRI to drive the Merc boards to drive the train. Um, but that should be fairly straightforward given that this bit is working. Um, so that's my plan. Eventually, I would love to get a field and build Reading or Cardiff or something like that. Um, but the storage alone, the storage tracks alone for something that was that big would probably take up at least this tent, if not more. Um, I also want to continue to update PyY Throttle to add more functionality. At the moment, it just drives trains. I want to get it doing the turnouts, the sig signaling, and anything else. If you know Python, if you want to get involved in this, jump on GitHub, come and have a look. Um, I'd love contributors. It's under the MIT license as well, so you know anyone can contribute to it. Um, and then finally, yeah, create more um, projects. Um, under the Model Railways as code banner. I've already started on one that actually lets you describe Model Railways as YAML. Um, and then you can run a decoder and it should, in theory, output a track plan that you can import into JMRI um, so that it draws all your panels on the thing. Um, that's not going as well as I'd hoped, but it's going, so there we are. Um, and that's it from me. Um, so thank you very much. If you've got any questions, I will be outside the tent um, at the end of this. Um, GitHub, Model Railways as Code, uh, GitHub Prof Falcon or Prof Falcon on Twitter. Um, thank you for your time. I hope that's been useful.